Hey, everybody. Welcome to Real Pod with Brad Martin and Isaac Thompson. Uh, today we have Chris Canduso on. I can honestly say a mortgage expert. Uh, Chris, so great to have you. You've helped me in countless deals from Niagara to Toronto, and I know you'll be working with Isaac soon. And uh, yeah, just thanks for coming on. No, I appreciate uh, you guys having thank me. You, thank you. Thank you. Nice man. to be here and looking forward to a good conversation. I'm going to just get cracking with the golden question, okay? This, for me at least, the importance of being pre-approved and, if you will, the difference between a soft approval and a firm approval. Yeah, so, I mean, where it all starts, step number one for any client and, and any realtor for that matter. Um, who, that, uh, who that client gets introduced to, which kind of mortgage broker, mortgage specialist, whatever we want to want to call the position, is of like the utmost critical this in order in regards to how this whole process plays out um sure. you know if they get introduced to the wrong individual at a bank or the wrong mortgage broker that can affect the whole pre-approval process and frankly it can really affect negatively affect um the realtor mm -hmm. right, in regards to the the client's experience with that realtor from start to finish so um yeah the the very big difference between a soft and a formal pre-approval uh, we'll use the word formal but uh to outline some of that, a uh, soft pre-approval essentially uh, is more of like you stating to a mortgage broker or a, a branch level uh, manager, you know, what your income credentials are. Um, you know, uh, not so many, it's more so stating information and little to no documents collected. And then a mortgage broker or mortgage specialist providing you with, you know, here's your pre-approval and it's based on stated information. And then they take that to a realtor and they start shopping. And a lot of the times this ends up backfiring because it's considered a soft pre-approval. It's almost like doing that online approval for a credit card. It's that simple. You're taking like often one number. You're, you're not asking about debt. And exactly. I call it the handshake. Like yeah, you can, you can it do is. it and you can almost get it done within the time it takes to have it. Totally. You're like, like 120,000 between the two of us. Oh, 520,000 approvable. That's right. <laughs> you know? And like 15 years ago in the mortgage environment, like, that probably flew yeah, because the qualification aspect was a lot easier. Yeah. Now, the scrutinization we have to go through for banks, uh, alternative lenders, there, there's, it's, it's pretty serious. So, um, you know, whether an income earner is a base salary, is there a variable compensation, commission, bonus, mm -hmm. all these things matter in deriving the income figure that we can use for a client's application, which is essentially going to dictate what that pre-approval looks like what kind of loan amount they can get approved for and, and how the process starts. So um, so that formal pre-approval, I often tell people, hey, it's going to be a tough couple of days. You're collecting this maybe a few days. But like what is like a, a standard? Let's just go with a standard residential formal approval kind yeah. of look like for you. And, you know, it's, it's an open-ended question because, yeah. um, and that's one of the things I think we pride ourselves or I pride myself in is that original intake call we do with a client uh, and asking the important questions, very detailed questions to know exactly what documents we need to ask for. Yeah. And often clients will send us, you know, not, not because they, they're trying not to send us everything, but if they only send us half, we say, hey, we can't, we can't work on the file until we have everything we need. And that goes uh, hand in hand with me explaining to a lot of the realtors I work with that we do such a precise job on that pre-approval side that we need, we need all the documents in order to give a clear idea to that client of what they can get qualified for. And ultimately, what purchase price range they can shop with to be successful with their realtor on converting and finding a great investment property or an owner occupied place. So, um, but yeah, I mean, documentation, letters of employment, pay stubs, T4s, if they're self-employed, we go through T1s and notice of assessments and stuff like that. And I think for me, uh, when I talk with you, I think I've taken a lot from you. You have a good swagger about you and Appreciate you're, that. you're rightfully so a confident person because you're great at your job. So um, that confidence from you, you can lend over to your clients with that formal pre-approval. They just feel really informed. They feel almost like locked into what they're a part of as opposed to maybe they can have something, right? That maybe becomes almost a locked in feeling. 100%. And, and confidence, you know, comes from experience, mm -hmm. um, knowing what you're talking about, being comfortable delivering that. I mean, this is the biggest asset purchase for majority of people's lives. Yeah. So um, we take that very seriously. And, you know, that process of the pre-approval right through to getting a client in the ready position, um, 
forces us to be great at knowing how to prepare a client. And, and the confidence comes from all of the years and different situations we've seen and, and knowing when to trust your gut and, and how to set up a file properly mm. um, to, to ultimately lead your client to the most success and, and the referral partner for that matter. Yeah. Just quickly, for whatever reason, I pictured cool runnings, the uh, bobsled <laughs> and the ready <laughs> position. Like imagine, yeah, yeah, like yeah. imagine you did one thing wrong oh, before man. going down and, that run. And here's the problem too, is like, as all of us know in the room right now, there's been so much rhetoric that's being passed through, especially from the economic standpoint, that inflation, which then gets taken into the next spectrum. And we're dealing with all these things. So one of the next questions for you as well was um, just talking a little bit about some of the different lending styles right now, because we've been asked a lot, um, you know, how do I go? Should I go to a bank? And we're going to get into that later. Yeah. But just in terms of, you know, let's use a, like an A lender, a B lender and a mono lender, for instance, yeah. right? For the majority of people, they're, they're not too familiar with the, the ideas behind those things. So how, from your perspective, do they work and how in some ways are they not the best for, you know, the average person? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. It's a loaded. And, it, and if you loaded, will, I, I think it's a lot. I think you will. I think you'll if you'll just kind of intro them as well. Yeah, just yeah, just to intro, sure. just to intro for sure. So yeah, and I wish it was more clear. Like I, I wish this was not yeah. so difficult for people yeah. to understand and get confused with because for sure. you know what I, what we know on our end of the business, uh, we have we can't expect a normal client to know. Mm -hmm. So you know we try to explain it the best we can. So the the way I break up the lending spectrum is in three levels. Yeah. So you have your A lenders, you have your B lenders, also known as alternative lenders, and then you have your private lending. Right away, often people confuse B lenders as a private lender, and that's not the case. Right. And I'll, I'll explain why. So an A lender essentially is your your bucket of uh, top tier lenders, which would be considered your big banks, your credit unions, mm -hmm. and the mono line lenders. So a mono line lender would be um, essentially a non-big bank mortgage lender only. So you can't get an RRSP account with them. You can't get a checking account. They provide uh, tier A level mortgages in Canada, competitive interest rates and quality of mortgage product to all the big banks and credit unions and, and often cases sometimes better. Um, so all three of those types of lenders, monoline, credit union, big bank, you're under traditional stress test qualification metrics more often than not. Um, B lenders, AKA alternative lenders. Um, they're also institutions. They're, they're not private. They're not interest only loans. Um, they're, they are amortized. They are institutional. They, the best way to explain them is they'll look at clients income a little bit more logically. Um, they'll look <clears throat> at, um, they're great for self-employed borrowers. They'll look at, you know, uh, revenue coming into a business. If you're incorporated or a sole proprietor, um, they're just a little bit more malleable. They have higher ratio exceptions um, and they come at a little bit of a higher interest rate than an A lender mm -hmm. and, and some fees up front as well. Now, people, you know, sometimes aren't always happy with B lenders, but they're an incredibly important component to the lending landscape in Canada. Um, people can still get good loans with them and, and have them for a long time. Yeah, I think B lenders, sometimes if people have... Um heard the wrong story they think about a b lender as when an a lender fails yeah but but you have to think about uh, if you correct me if i'm wrong you have to think about it as as a, a totally different alternative to to looking at possibly your income or your revenue or um if you're looking at it that way i think it's a more all-encompassing and it's not just when you fail with a you go to b totally and and one of the reasons why i always say i would never work for one bank or one institution is because i like meeting a client, a new lead and understanding their whole situation, what they're trying to achieve, and then finding them the best possible solution or for what they can qualify for. And sometimes that starts with a B lender, but that's not to say, well, hey, you can't, maybe they're savings considerable in money on taxes by sheltering more money in their corporations right. and whatnot. So I always say you can't have the best of both worlds. Yeah. Can't be someone yeah. who retains all their capital in a corp and then expects to always have an A lending mortgage on your fifth property. <laughs> but it's, it's so right? interesting that you say that though, because the majority of people watching, I think there, there's uh there's the unfortunate, the, the unfortunate side of just assumption based learning. Yeah. Right. And, and unfact checked learning. Like we can be in a room together right now, talking mortgage, talking numbers. And you're fact checking it because you're a mortgage professional and you do the best work. So it's like, we don't have a problem in here discussing numbers, but some people may think at times that those private lenders 
or what others call B lenders and vice versa. So totally. even when the rhetoric behind those things starts getting mixed up, it's like you might have to take that step back again and just be able to actually acknowledge where it's coming from before you go any further because it does people damage if they don't open up their eyes sometimes to just be able to see like a lot of people you mentioned corporations in the in the bees yeah right? and a lot of people uh, have never heard about that before totally and and that's why you know we take a, a stand of when we get to meet someone we, we try to understand what they can qualify for and then explaining to them how the lending landscape works and why a B lender is great, especially if that's the only thing they can get approved for. Right. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, it's better than an A lender in any way if you if you can qualify for an A lender. Yeah. But there are a ton, a large percentage of Canadians who, who, who have down payment capital to invest, but based on how they're structured income wise, can only qualify with a B lender. So they need to, you know, you need to accept that, understand how that can be of huge assistance and to you growing your net worth and your property mm -hmm. portfolio and, and working with a good mortgage broker to understand the ins and outs on which terms are best and what kind of B lending institutions are, are better for you because they vary across the board. You have the underwriters in house. Yeah. So I have a, I have a team of a, of a couple of underwriters that work with me. Um, I call them business partners mm -hmm. at, at this point. Yeah. Um, they're integral to my success. Um, I'm integral to theirs. We work very closely together. We're yeah. all very good at different things. I had to learn how to underwrite before working mm -hmm. with them. So I'm capable of doing everything from start to finish. Yeah. But as we do larger volumes and try to grow our business, we have now different departments that work on different things at different times. And um, we don't see that at the bank, right? No. It's, it's, well, no, you will see it at the bank. They, they are un internal yeah, underwriting departments. Yeah. The problem is, the is that... Time. And and you're and you as a client are just a number at the bank, right? right. You refer to the cattle cattle comparison. Mm -hmm. You know, the 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 mortgage specialist you'll meet at a bank. You know, and there's a lot of great mortgage specialists at the bank. I'm not saying that there's not, um, but you know, they'll take a client in, and then if they want to use an underwriter, a department internally, they'll push the file up. Now that underwriting department, they may like certain mortgage specialists at the bank better than others, but ultimately. They have no allegiance or wanting to make sure your file is being followed up on in a certain way or a certain level. Sure. Um, right. And you'll never be able to control that from a, a large bank level. So. I think that there's so much value. I didn't mean to cut you off there. I hope I didn't. No, no. I think <laughs> no. that there's so much value in that because when you think I love about hearing it, your guys' perspectives on this. And I well, think it'll it'll lead me to providing even more value to, to the question. It's, because it's, it's, really, it's really interesting the way that, that that sort of feels because, you know, we, we, you had actually just spoken about at the end of the day, it doesn't matter about the subtle nuances between each one of the, um, each one of the different banks and the way that they're going to be doing the underwriting on their side and what they have put in for relative the, to the end user relative client. to the yeah. end user client, because at the end of the day, it's very similar with us. That client, let's say has $600,000, dollars we we'll keep it an even number and wants to get this out of it. And that your job is to then go into your office and perform that clockwork and that beautiful dance around of how to get to that number where it's the same way with us that people really don't see half the work that we do in terms of That's the, right. the comparable and all this stuff and the values in it there for, I think the majority of people not to see. Totally. And, and we go the extra level of like, right? you know, on my intake call, it could be like, Hey, we'll show you multiple different scenarios, you know? Yeah. yeah okay. Let's say you can get approved for all this. Do you want to see a, a, a simulation at 800 K 850, 900 K? Do you want to see with this amount of down payment, that amount of down payment? Let me show you basically everything you can get approved for in different ways of structuring a deal so you can see side-by-side -side comparables. Now, everyone's capable of doing this. Some do it better than others. But the underwriting side for us really separates itself with the access to the amount of different banks. Mm -hmm. So when we work with 15 to 20 different banks on any given time, we, we get a client's information and do, in income docs. And right away, there might be one little red flag or little asterisk besides something, whether that's time they've been at that employer, how they're earning commission. There's so many things that I'm not going to get into now. Mm -hmm. But we, as people that memorize and, and study and become experts of all these banks' policies and constantly in co conversations with the different business relationship managers at these lenders, we know right away... This isn't going to work here, 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 or here, but it may work here, here, here. So right away that like we create like a, a, like a whiteboard of knowing what options do we have? And then we're able to provide the client with the best possible 
solution relative to that qualification criteria. And that is underwriting. Yeah. And, and the, the people, it's hard because the banks, all these different bank policy books change. Like every, every few weeks, there's a, there's a new Zoom meeting with a change. And then, they, and then the stress test changes. Mm-hmm. And then interest rates change every week. So it's, there's a constant moving target. And sometimes we have to constantly go back and forth. But, um, you know, I work with some great people that stay on top of a lot of those micro details more than me. And together, we form a great team to provide the highest level of expertise and service to any client we get an opportunity to work with and feel feel super confident about that. Yeah. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong. It makes me think of um, my fourth year at Brock was tough, right? I was, uh, I'm an English lit major, right? Did I, did I, do I use it every day? No, but maybe, you, maybe you <laughs> hear it in my words occasionally. But anyhow, um, at that point, I had five classes each term. I had five TAs. And I was writing a pepper, paper, writing an essay, 10,000 words or more, basically at all times. Now, if I handed in the same style of paper to each TA, they would get a different mark. And just learning that little bit, those nuances, is, is, is all the difference. Totally. And knowing who you're dealing with. And knowing that for the client. The client doesn't, like we said, the client doesn't have to know it. But you knowing that for the client is huge. The other thing is, when you talked about the scenario building, and I'll, I'll you know pat your back a little bit here, not everyone does do that. And it does provide a lot of flexibility or at least flexibility of uh, your frame of mind, right? So if I told you like 600 is the hard stop, right? And, you know, let's just say something that you fell for was just outside of that boundary. Wouldn't you want to know that it's actually in your grasp? Wouldn't you want to know that if you have a year's worth of car payments and you pay off your car, it's in your grasp, right? So those little things do set people apart in the mortgage world and they're not every day. Um, I'm not trying to say the wrong thing about the big banks, but I don't see a lot of the scenario building from the big banks. Yeah. And the, and the, and the complete micro detail of paying attention Mm -hmm. to those things, because like to your point, if someone just gives you a number of like max 600 K based on, you know, qualification criteria you have down payment, et cetera. Well, you know, in, in the GTA um, and a lot of other communities now that have more condos and stuff, you know, what are the condo fees? Yeah. What are the property taxes? Like, believe it or not, like a couple hundred dollar variance on those things can dictate the difference between a purchase price being yeah. 600 and with that same qualification criteria being 610, 615. Absolutely. We, you know, we're very transparent with, you know, if, it, if there is a referral partner on, on the file, it's, you know, explaining to them and the client basically you need to provide us with that, you know, MLS listing so that basically when we get that, we can tailor that approval at that moment in time to, to that property. And that's sometimes I've seen it in multiple offers, that extra three, four grand is actually the difference between winning and losing. Yep. And I've got multiple stories uh, of being on the other side with clients and realtors and everyone's thrilled. So it's just going the extra length to be very detailed, very organized. It takes a, it takes a huge toll on us. Because every time, like, we'll have clients sometimes offer on eight to 10 different properties before winning. Mm-hmm. We're involved on every one. Yep. We're tailoring at, you know, 9, 10, 11 p.m. sometimes to, to give that information to the, the client mm-hmm. and their realtor to go execute. Yep. So it, it, it takes a, it's a lot out of us and our team. But I've always lived my life between being the difference between winning and losing. And that's how you get clients ahead that's how you get referral partners ahead and And that's how everyone wins and that's how everyone wins and i want to be on teams like that so if i can be if i can do my component to just add that little level of a bump up to get us there and and we're in the business of a client's success story is yours too absolutely and and then a client's success might be that client's family member's success and then that built success and then that built relationship and that's where it all and you know when you're that you provide that value. And I think we're both in that business of just, if you just ride the, the wave of the client success, it, it puts you on a very solid path too. There's also a, I think a small part of it is, um, your environmental and situational ability as well. So for instance, being able to do what you do and provide such amount of value in such a professional setting, right? On the realtor side of it, you know, we start working together there's an assumption already in my head right here. 
I have to be a game all times because he's he's going to be ready at all times now. So now you're bringing the most out of not only your staff, but you're bringing the most of the other guys that you're working with. And hopefully that translates all the way down the line so that everyone ends up having the exact same amount of service. Mm -hmm. No one's doing their, you know, fucking around. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I'm going to give it the one no, swear you're, word. You're, I'm going to give it the one <laughs> swear word during the podcast. It's always you. Yeah, just, no, kidding. No. just kidding. But do you know what I mean though? You are creating single-handedly this sort of outpouring of professionalism that everyone has to abide by if they're going to be dealing with that, right? Because imagine I'm a bum and I'm, I'm not doing my job well with not, no due diligence. You wouldn't be able to get anything done. There would have to be a point where you'd go, Isaac, what's, what's going on here, man? And I have had experiences like right? that. And I always say like, you know, every mortgage broker is not for every realtor. Every realtor is not for every mortgage broker. Every client's not for every mortgage broker and every client's not for every realtor. We all think that we can all coexist perfectly with everyone. And the reality is, is that we can't. Yeah. You know, and I've had longstanding relationships with a lot of great realtors. Um, they've become friends, uh, associates, and they know what they're going to get from me. They, they know what they can expect m myself and my team to bring to the table and um, there's a level of expectation and we, we, we need to deliver at that yeah, level, right? So we call it, you know, a realtor gets a lead. It could be a 10 minute conversation. First thing a realtor needs to do is get their client pre-approved or know that their client's pre-approved. So yes. whether a client comes saying, yes, I am, I feel very comfortable. As you said, Brad, you're not going to push the envelope on wanting to make sure they work with your trusted mortgage broker all the time. Yeah. But if you have the opportunity to refer someone, uh, we're the tone setters. Yep. We set the tone of what this is going to look like. And obviously not every approval is always pretty. Sometimes it doesn't work out and the client's not as happy, but mm -hmm. we will protect the realtor's time in that case. Yes. Very undervalued. Um, and we set the tone on preparing a client to get in the ready position so that the realtor can do their job at the highest level. I yeah, can remember and a that's scenario. Important. Crazy, Nothing yeah. worse than shopping in an environment that's completely out of a client's capability of getting qualified for despite what they might want and there's a big difference between a, want big, and qualified but for, here's the right? thing so i think it leads us to one of the other points that we were going to bring up too and i think that part of it now is, is something that you're you've probably seen and experienced quite a bit in toronto is the 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 way that general generational wealth is passing through right now because it's a very interesting time um and so just talk to me a little bit about how the baby boomers downwards is affected from your perspective a little bit of the stuff that's been going on recently yeah, I, it's that's a great topic um seeing it a lot more in the last year or two mm -hmm. i think a lot of that has to do with just as real estate prices are, are going up qualification is becoming harder incomes aren't necessarily increasing at the same pace mm -hmm. it's becoming very hard for people between the ages of you know 25 and 40 to buy property in their respective locations. So I wouldn't even say this is a Toronto thing. I mean, we see it a little bit more there, mm -hmm. um, but you know, we, we, we do, we do funding across Canada in a lot of different scenarios. So I've seen it in Niagara Falls, I've seen it in Toronto, I've seen it in Oakville, I've seen it in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the baby boomer generation is like the best saving generation of all time. Mm -hmm. And um, they have a lot of money from a general, you know, perspective. And a lot of their children are struggling with saving enough money to get in the market. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll chalk it up like this. For my, my book of business, I would say eight of every 10 first-time homebuyers right now are getting either gifted down payment and or a co-signer on the file. Wow. Um, and uh, in the last 12 months, with home prices being as high at the, at the highest peak, um, plus qualification becoming even harder, the stress test, interest rates going up. I've seen larger gifts for yeah. their children to buy an owner-occupied property. Mm -hmm. So um, I've seen small gifts. I've seen monster gifts. Mm -hmm. It's all relative to everyone's capability. Of course. Obviously, this is a, you know, a small percentage of the population who may be able to provide that kind of gift um, to, to get their child into a home. But for that population that is, it's happening. And I've seen gifts anywhere from 50 grand to one and a half million dollars in the last year. Wow. And I think from the back end of things, we're probably starting to see gifts more and more as the boomers are now retiring, right? So when you don't have uh, the same compensation, we don't have that active salary. Um, sure, you might have a great pension and you might have considerable savings, but if they're 
you know, there's different ways to look at those savings, different ways to look at the investments that they have. If they're not factoring into the the cosine, I think that's probably where we're getting some of those big, uh, bigger gifts, you know, when you get away from the salary from some of the boomer parents. Yeah. And uh, I will say that a lot of these uh, baby boomers who do have the capability to gift, they prefer not to go on title or, or be a guarantor on a yeah. deal. Um but this whole concept of early inheritance is becoming a real topic. And uh, the baby, baby boomer generation is going to be the generation that starts this trend, once again, for whoever this apl- that applies to, not, not the vast majority. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you know, there's a certain level of wealth or savings for certain individuals uh, that they have earmarked for a child or children, there's an idea now that, hey, why not pass this down to my child in their late 20s, early 30s, instead of waiting for myself to essentially pass away and my estate to pass down as per the instruction. Mm -hmm. And the idea there is for, once again, those that applies to, can I get my child further ahead through a safe investment like real estate? Right. You know, you're not giving your kid 200 grand to go buy a Ferrari. Right. You're giving them 200 grand to buy an owner-occupied house. Mm -hmm with a good mortgage product that's going to pay down debt yeah. and, pro- and likely appreciate over a, a period of time and get your child that much further ahead. So we're seeing a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it's going to stop. In fact, I think as the conversation becomes a lot easier to be had, this whole in early inheritance conversation will pick up steam over the next five to 10 years. Yeah. I couldn't agree more as we see that. Uh, so a lot of people use mortgage calculators. The one I find more fun. Well, More fun, but also just more uh, eye-opening is your uh, affordability and your your income calculator and that kind of thing there when you're actually looking at a bit of income and debt. And, you know, I'm looking at Niagara. I'm looking at a little bit of a sagging job market and and salaries and average salaries and average income. So we're not even getting close to our average household. When, even if you multiply that by two and you have a two income house where mm-hmm. we're, we're actually far from a lot of our average households once you put that stress test and that on there. So yeah, I see that coming in hard. I think you're seeing it a little more than us so far in the Toronto area, but I think it's, it's a, it's just a matter of time and truly really a matter of time with the years and in the age of those. That population. Yeah. And it's, it's switching the, it's switching the narrative of the topic, you know, and, and, Unfortunately, something like early inheritance probably only po- applies to a s- small percentage of the population. And therefore, because of that, a lot of other people will ne- have a negative connotation to the idea of it. Yeah. So, you know, working past that and, you know, even if it's a small amount of money, it's it's could be the difference between your child getting in in, you know, 2023 versus 2028. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if we all believe that we have an inventory issue and immigration is going to stay at the levels that they are, it's a high likelihood five years from now that this is even more prevalent. Yeah. And the cost of this house is going to be more. 